Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you. Hey, I, all these that sit down front, thank you so much. So yeah. I feel like more and more the crowd moves further and further back week by week. So so the front row people, so. Yeah, look at Mark Turley. Good grief, All man. the way in the back. Look at that. So that's all right. That must the, the safe distance must be that first row of rectangle tables or something. I don't know. But hey, it's good to have you guys tonight. We're glad you're here. Hope you got a handout over there in the basket by the table. We're going to jump in, but we're going to pray, and then we will get started. I tried to let Matt Ball pray last week to kick us off, but... Um, but a Paul guy named better. Paul uh, jumped the gun, and y- you never, you never like confront a guy in a Hawaiian shirt and tell him he can't pray. So Matt was smart and just let Paul pray. So, but Matt, would you open us in prayer tonight? Amen. Amen. All right. So moving on tonight, we are looking at the mercy and grace of God uh, tonight. So this is going to be a we're going to go quickly tonight because we got a lot we want to try to cover in a little bit of time. So this maybe work for you to do at home to just unpack some of the scriptures we don't get to talk about homework homework this week. That's right. It's always good when you can open a Bible study by quoting Charles Spurgeon. So you've got a couple of Spurgeon quotes for your library there in your notebook. But look at what Spurgeon says there on the screen or in your notes about God's mercy and God's grace. I love his gift of language. God's mercy is so great that you may sooner drain the sea of its water or deprive the sun of its light or make space too narrow than diminish the great mercy of God. Mm. And then about God's grace, men go astray from God by nature, but they only return to God through grace. And so tonight we're going to dive in and just see how scripture talks about each of those uniquely and what we see in God's word about his mercy and his grace. But then we're going to see how they work together in scripture. So this is going to be a rich uh, study for us as we do that. But I want to give you a minute around your tables to just have a conversation, just define what mercy is around your table. Or if you only are, if you're at a table by yourself, maybe join with another table But just talk about that for a minute. What is grace and what is mercy? We're going to give you just three or four minutes to do that. And then we're going to jump in and see what God's word has to say. So take some time around your table. All right, we're ready. Hopefully you had some good dialogue around your table about mercy and grace. And so here's the Here's the challenge. You know how in school sometimes you you take a quiz and then you pass your paper to the seat beside you or behind you or in front of you and they grade your paper for you? So as we go through these scriptures tonight, you're going to grade each other on how you did with defining mercy and grace, right? So that you're just going to see how did your table do coming up with definitions of those things. But we want to jump in and start with mercy this evening. So some passages you have there on your in your handout starting on page 44. If you look down in the bottom right corner, we're going to see some passages here. One of the first things I think it's important for us to understand about mercy is it is the foundation of the forgiveness that God expresses when he pardons sin. Mercy is foundational in that. Um, It's a divine quality that God possesses when he remains faithful to his covenant, even when his people turn away. They're unworthy of that. Uh, Do we see that in scripture? Do we see examples of God remaining faithful even when his people uh, are faithless, when they wander away and God is still upholding his end of, of the covenant that he made with his people Israel? Yeah, we see that. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 30 here, verses one through six. Like the Lord is talking to them here. And he says, and when all these things come upon you, the blessings and the curses, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you and return to the Lord your God, 
you and your children, and you obey his voice in all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. And this was, look at what it says after that. He will gather you again from the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offsprings. Why? So that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. I mean, this, this picture here with Moses is addressing the children of Israel before they're about to go into the promised land with a new leader. Joshua is gonna take them in. And so Moses is reminding them of all that God has done. And he's even given them warnings about if you turn away from the Lord, this is what the Lord will do. This is what he will do. But here, Moses is even summarizing, like if you wander, if you wander from the Lord and he has to scatter you through his mercy, through his kindness, he will gather you again. This beautiful picture of even the Lord saying, I know you're going to turn away again. I know you're going to wonder. You're going to do all the things that I warned you about in the beginning of Deuteronomy mm -hmm. in chapter six, where he says, hey, teach these things to your children. Remind them of who I am, my character, the way I provided for you and cared for you and protected you and took you into a land that you did not deserve. You didn't do anything to earn it. You lived in houses you didn't build. You, you got to eat crops that you didn't plant. Uh, and God blesses you in that way. He says, you must remember the Lord in those days and not turn away from him. But he says, but if you do, I will discipline you. And here in Deuteronomy, at the end here in chapter 30, he's saying, yes, I will discipline you. But he talks about why he will discipline them. And I think this is powerful for us to see God's mercy, even in his discipline, it, this mercy to gather them, to circumcise their hearts because at the very core, that's what they need, amen? They need a heart change so that they will not stray from the Lord. So as you're reading your Bible, right, and you know Israel is going into the promised land, okay, is God surprised by their hard-heartedness? Is God surprised that Israel as a people is unfaithful? God is not surprised by any of it, right? And yet he is still patient, yet he is still unfolding his magnificent plan. So good. In other places throughout the Old Testament, God is even saying the same thing. Look in Nehemiah chapter 9. God says, "In nevertheless, in your great mercies, you, talking about the Lord, did not make an end of them. You were gracious and merciful. God had every right to just forget Israel, to turn his back on them because of their disobedience and their rebellion. But he says, you, Nehemiah says, God, you did not make an end of them and you could have. Why did he not? Because of his mercy. Isaiah chapter 14, the Lord will have compassion on Jacob, on the people of Israel and will again choose them and will set them in their own land. Daniel chapter nine, it says, to the Lord belongs grace mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. So all through the Old Testament, we see this picture of Israel has a rebellious heart, but God has a merciful heart. And he wants to show mercy to his people, even when they are turning away from him. Paul yeah, talks, go ahead. Yeah, there's an aspect of patience that's tied into this, right? Absolutely. Right? Knowing they will disobey, knowing they will turn away, there's, there's an idea of, of patience uh, that unfolds a merciful heart. Yeah. And then Paul, picking up on this theme in the book of Romans, right, he, makes it, he gives some guardrails here. He goes, don't presume upon it to be like, well, the Lord has to show mercy, right? Like I can do whatever I want. I can be as rebellious as I want to be because God has to show mercy. Look at what Paul says in Romans 9. He says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion, right? So we see here clearly as we see it is God's heart to show mercy, but it is his sovereign choice 
to display that mercy on, on people. This is all part of who he is. It's attached to him, right? But it is, it is a loving, it is a patient, it is a compassionate thing for God to show mercy. And in that idea, we see mercy has with it this idea of God is withholding from someone something they deserve. That's what we see in all those passages that we just looked at, right? God is staying his hand of judgment for a reason, showing compassion on his people. Another principle we see about mercy is that it is intricately connected to his love. Look at Psalm 51 verses one and two. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Who wrote this Psalm? When did David write this Psalm? Little little quiz for you, Bible quiz for you here. Yeah, after he's been confronted by his sin with Bathsheba by the prophet Nathan. David is broken over his sin. And in Psalm 51, he writes this, have mercy on me, O God. Why could David cast himself on the mercy of God? Because he understood the character of God, that he is loving, that he wants to show mercy. So David comes with a repentant heart, believing that God will show mercy on him. He, scripture def- describes God as the father of mercies. You see that 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. I love that picture, the Father of mercies. You think about a father, right? And we see genealogies all through Scripture, right? We say this father begat this child and then this father begat this child, right? So we see that, right? A father begets children. God, as the father of mercy, begets mercy. That's what he, that's what he does. There is a family resemblance, right? When you think about God and mercy, right? The people of God should be quick to show mercy. He is the, the author of, of mercy. I think that's a beautiful picture when we think about that. Second Samuel. Uh, chapter 24, verse 14 says that his mercy is great. Again, we're dealing with David here. David's sin with Bathsheba is not David's only big sin. A lot of times that's the one we think about, but there's another big one recorded in the end of David's life when he decides in pride, he wants to take a census of the people right? to just show all that he has done as Israel's greatest king. And God God deals with him harshly. And he says, you have choices about what, you, what I will do to punish you for this. And he lays out three different choices for David, right? You can have this, these people come in to destroy you. You can have this happen, or he says, or I will do this. And look at what he says. David says to Gad, I am in great dis- distress. He's not sure what to choose. But then in this moment, he says, let us fall into the hand of the Lord for his mercy is great, but let me not fall into the hand of man, right? So David here, having lived his life, right? Gone through heartache because of his choices, right? He's seen the dysfunction uh, and the, the, the consequences that it caused even in his family, right? Even through all the things David endured through his life, he knows even here at, in, at the end of his life that it is better for him to fall upon the hand of the Lord and let God deal with him because he knows that even in discipline, God will always discipline in a merciful way. I think that's a beautiful picture uh, when we think about God's mercy. And then the last thing here, in Ephesians chapter two, verse four, something else we see about mercy is that it says God is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. It's the only thing in scripture that God is said to be rich in. Did you know that? It's the only thing we see in scripture that says God is rich in this, right? When we see God's judgment, it's exact, right? He he judges just the amount he has to. But when we read about his mercy, 
He's rich in that, right? He, he, go, he gives a, he lavishes it upon, upon those that he shows mercy to. It's a beautiful picture of his character, amen? So an important thing for us to understand when we think about God's mercy. Anything you wanna add before we, we got, we got a lot to cover, so we're, gonna, we're kinda going quickly. So let's look at grace for a minute. Let's, let's also figure out what's wrong with this microphone here. I'll stand up, maybe that'll... I don't know. I don't know. No cables pinched. No, not touching the beard. All right. We'll try it again. See how it goes. God's grace. I want us to look at God's grace and his grace is talked about in a couple of ways in scripture. Uh, A couple of categories that it's put in a lot of times. God's common grace and God's saving grace. So we're gonna think about that for just a few minutes, okay? So God's common grace, I wanna see how we see that expressed in scripture here. First of all, God shows grace to all of humanity. Think about that for a minute, right? God does, grace, when we think of, like I said, when we think of mercy, maybe around your table, you guys saw this distinction a little bit that when we think about God's mercy, there's an element of what God doesn't do. There are things that he doesn't do that we deserve. That's, that's merciful, But when we think about God's grace, we think about things that God gives us that we don't deserve. Well, when we think about God's grace, a lot of times we attach that to how God shows his grace to us as as those who have placed their faith in Jesus. But in scripture, we see examples where God shows grace to all of humanity. Psalm 145, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made, right? God shows grace to everyone. Matthew 5, verse 45, the sun rises on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. So all are recipients of God's common grace. Luke 6, uh, verse 35, he's kind to the ungrateful and even to the evil. In Acts chapter 14, when Paul and Barnabas are at Lystra, um, he says, and he did not leave himself without witness for he did good by giving you rains from heaven in fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. As Paul is addressing a crowd there in Lystra, he's reminding them, God has been gracious to you, right? Even when you have not known him, he has shown his grace to you. Yeah, so there's an expectation in, in all people to recognize the good gifts of, of life, okay? Uh, things like food and uh, provision, and that we should see those things, and everyone should rejoice in God's, uh, in God's grace towards us. Amen. So another aspect of God's common grace, right? It's, it's, things that he does for all of humanity, but also how he will restrain sin in the lives of individuals in society, right? I mean, think about, think about the ways we see evil in our world today. Is it apparent? Do we see wickedness? Do we see corruption? Do we see pain? Do we see suffering in our world today? Should, because of sin, we've spent a lot of time on this so far, right? In our, in our times together, thinking about the holiness of God and our sinfulness and all that our sin has done, how it's infected all of humanity in so many ways. Should we be surprised when we see the condition of our world today? No, honestly, we should probably say, why isn't it what? Worse. Right? It, it should be so much worse when you think about what man is capable of in, in his sin. So part of God's common grace are the things that he, he withholds, right? The, the way that he restrains sin. We see an example of this in Genesis chapter 20 uh, with the, the king Abimelech and Abraham. God said to Abimelech in the dream, yes, I know that you, that what, that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. He's talking about how he took Sarah to be his wife because Abraham had lied about who she was, saying this was his sister. 
Um, and so Abimelech was about to take her to be his wife uh, and consummate the relationship. But what does it look at what it says? God says, it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. So we see God's intervention and we see it as a gracious thing that he restrained even this king who did not know the Lord in this moment. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, we see examples here. Again, David, David's a, a common theme here when we think about God's mercy and God's grace in scripture. David is angry with, um, with Abigail's husband, uh, Nabal, thank you, yes, Nabal in this moment. Uh, and he is ready to exact his judgment and take Nabal's life. But Abigail comes to David and pleads for the life of her husband, not because she really thinks he doesn't deserve the punishment, but she's wanting to protect David. And so she pleads with him. And then look, it says, the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt because she listened to David. She said, listen, don't do this. Let God judge him. And, Dave, and she says, she, she recognizes, she said, it's the Lord who is restraining you from shedding the blood of this man. And then David realizes it. And in verse 34, it says, for as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from hurting you unless you had hurried and come to meet me? Um, David even recognizes it. If you were to read on in the story, God does deal with Nabal. Um, like that very night, he deals with Nabal, but, but we see in this passage that it's God's grace that keeps David from sinning against the Lord in his anger and in this moment here. Um, when we look at God's common grace, um, we see that examples of that are when people who are unsaved do good things, even though they're lost. Do you know people who are not believers that do good things? That are kind? I don't see a lot of heads moving in either direction. Yeah. So, Yes. Yeah, of course. There are. There are people who do kind things, who, who, who are generous, who are sometimes even sacrificial in, in what they do, right? We see that. Um, you know, we could get into debates about their motives, like, well, why are they doing that? Are they doing that, you know, for, for a, you know, an ungodly reason, right? But, but there are examples of, of unsafe people doing things that if we did not know better, we would say, that's something a Christian would do. Uh, that's something someone who knows Jesus would do. They just showed love. They just showed mercy. They were just gracious to someone. Uh, why does that happen? What happens because of God's grace? We see that in Romans chapter two, right? Whenever we see someone doing something good, look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse nine. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? So whenever we see someone doing something that we would say is good, we would say, well, that is evidence of God's grace in that person's life that they would do that because that is not something that they would do naturally uh, because their hearts are wicked. Our hearts are wicked. So common grace, you understand just that idea that there is an element of God's grace that we see that is evident in our world and in people. Still with us? You there? All right, now how about God's saving grace? What is that all about? I think this is where we probably are a little more familiar, a little, little more understanding when we think about how God shows grace in, in our lives. First of all, we have to understand, to understand his saving grace, you know, what we've seen over our last several weeks together, that no one is righteous. Romans chapter three, there is none righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God. So where, how, do, how do we become righteous? Through faith in Christ. Look at what it says in verse 22 of Romans 3. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Well, how do we, how do we place our faith in Jesus? Look at Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. 
Salvation, we must place our faith in Christ, but where does the ability to place faith in Christ come from? From God, right? And it is, and we see Paul describes it as a gift, right? By, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. God gives us the gift through his grace of being able to place our faith in Jesus. Even the ability to place faith in him comes from him. Isn't that, isn't that remarkable? Just to, just to pause long enough to think about that. Right, even your ability to see your own sin and see that you need a savior, you can't even do that on your own without the mercy and the grace of God that he pours out on, on you. It all comes from his hand. So I've given, I've given an illustration in a, uh, in a sermon before um, with uh, kind of a, a picture of... Uh, uh, kind of the the most common ways that uh, that s- scripture speaks and the way that it talks about uh, the either the the call of God on, unto salvation and that is you're on this side and then there's the cross and then when you're on then when you're on this side um, and when you're on when you're on this side you're unsaved and the cross is in front of you uh, th- there is there is a call we we call this uh, uh, it's there's there's the call of the gospel to everyone. Come, come to uh, faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, and if you don't come, the scripture says, "What? Why didn't you come? Because of your sin, right? That's what scripture would hold you responsible. Like you 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 didn't come because of your sin. The call was there. You should have come, but." Scripture teaches, and this is what we're looking at, this is why I'm describing this, right? It then teaches the believer when you're on this side of the cross and you look back at events in your life and you sort through, how did I come to salvation? And you look back, what, what does the Scripture teach you to say for why you came? I came because of Him, because He saved me, because He gave me eyes to see, because His Spirit called me because he was was working in the midst of people and preachers and circumstance and my grandma prayed for me and all of that stuff but you would you would look back and and you would say that was a gift from him that he and his spirit opened my eyes and gave me faith to see it was because of his grace towards me amen you know, last week I did it. I'm going to do it again today. There's a, there's a testimony video coming up this Sunday, okay? I said last week it was a week away. I'm so excited for you to hear it this Sunday uh, in a baptism that will be in the second service. Uh, but even in that testimony, what Jason just described is what this person describes in their testimony of now that I am saved, I can see how God was the one leading me every step of the way to get me to that point. I mean, it's beautiful to hear someone unpack it in their life with, with those details of, oh, well, I, I see God was doing this. And you know, now looking back, it's so intentional that he would have done that. And in the moment, it just seemed like just a regular course of the day. But now I can say, but that was God. And then that was God. And that was God, right? Where does that come from? Why, why can we say that? It's when we understand like this, these attributes of who he is, right? That he is a gracious God. He is a merciful God. And one of the ways he shows that is in the way he leads us to that point of seeing our sin so that we will fall upon his grace, right? Place our faith in him and trust in him. That's what Philippians 1 verse 6 says. And that's kind of our last point here. This work of salvation It's a gracious work that God does in Christ and it is initiated by him and it is completed by him. I am sure of this, Paul says, that he who began a good work in you will be the one to bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news? When you think about your walk with Christ, aren't you thankful that it is not you that holds yourself to Christ? That it is him who holds you? 
And that you can even say, God, the grace that and mercy that brought me to you is the grace and the mercy that will hold me and that will finish what you started in me. And there's a freedom and there's a confidence there, right? To be able to, to walk with him secure in that knowledge. Um, I mean, think about the, the weight you carry when you think you have to hold yourself to him, right? That it is your doing that holds you to Christ, right? I mean, the, the heaviness and the burden that you carry with that legalism, uh, right? When we understand his grace and mercy, there, there's a freedom that, that we experience knowing it's what he has done. Yeah, guys, this, this is why we will, we will teach uh, really hard against um, denominations or teaching that, that teach that you can lose your salvation, okay? This, this idea, right, that it is you who has to hold on to Christ is, uh, is, is com- completely uh, warped. It is, it is daunting. Uh, it is unscriptural. Um, but just think of the weariness that that puts on on uh, the individual, right? And yet you you come to passages like this and and you read them, right? And what does this stir up in your soul, right? He who began a good work in you, that is the one that's going to bring it to completion all the way until the day of Christ Jesus. What does that stir up in your soul? A peace. Peace. The thankfulness, right? A rest, right? Can't, can't you just take a deep breath and go, hallelujah, he has saved me. Guess what? I make it until the end. Yes, praise God. So a, a completely different understanding of salvation. There we go. There was that one. Sorry, I didn't go on with the slides. All right, I want, you to, I want us to spend just a few minutes here looking at three passages of Scripture that you have in your notes there. Um, I encourage you to flip there. You can, if you want to open in your Bible to look at those instead of your notes, do that. But I want us to work through these three passages. I've highlighted some phrases for you that'll kind of keep us on track. But all three of these passages just show the mercy and the grace of God and how they're so intricately connected and how they work together in this beautiful picture of the gospel and what the gospel is doing in us. So first of all, in Titus chapter three, verses four through seven, look at this, uh, how he starts out. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. You see that phrase, loving kindness? When you see that phrase in scripture, you know what word you could put there? You could instead... And you would be right. Mercy. The loving kindness of God, a way that that is interpreted in scripture many times is mercy, is one of the words that's used here. So it says, when the loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, what did he do? He saved us, right? Like his mercy, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to what? His own mercy. Do you think Paul is wanting us to get the point here of where salvation comes from? Right? It's in the heart of God and it is, it is displayed through his mercy. It is through his mercy. He washes us and renews us, right? Places his Holy Spirit in us. Look, whom he poured out on us, like frugally, richly. Was he stingy with the way he lavished his mercy and grace upon us, even by giving us his Holy Spirit to indwell us? No, it says he lavished it. He gave it to us richly. Why? So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Guys, I want you just to marvel for a minute. All right, we've looked at the holiness of God We've seen how the holiness of God, when we, when we have placed our faith in Jesus, 
right? That there is a call on our lives because we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, because we have received grace and he has shown us mercy. We should strive to live in a way that glorifies God. We should not just be cavalier when it comes to sin in our lives and say, well, God's merciful, God's gracious. I don't have to worry about that. No, the press is that we would be so careful to honor him because of what he's done for us. But I want you to pause though for a minute tonight and I want you to just marvel at when God lavishes his grace and mercy upon us. One of the things that is ours, he makes us an heir with him. Right? Paul describes that multiple ways throughout the Old Testament. He says that we are citizens of heaven. He says that we're adopted into his family. It says that we have received an inheritance as sons and daughters of the king of kings. Right? All of those things are testimonies right? that we are recipients of his mercy and his grace. And it gives us a hope that is ours. Amen? Another passage I want you to see in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. Look at this right here. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Why? Because he judged me faithful. Right? I would tell you that phrase right there is an example of his mercy. Was Paul faithful in and of himself? What was Paul before Christ found him? The chief of sinners, yeah. He was a blasphemer. He was, he was a persecutor <laughs> of Christ, right? He says, but it says God judged him faithful, right? That's an example, that's an, that's, it shows God's mercy. His mercy is on center stage. He judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. There's God's grace at work in the life of Paul. Paul gave, or God gave Paul a new task, right? Called him to a new life, commissioned him to go and to take the gospel to the Gentiles. That is all evidence of God's grace in Paul's life. And he says, look, formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, I was insolent, right? But he says, but listen to his testimony. I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me. Now, is that ignorance that Paul says he had, was that an excuse for him to act the way he did, right? Could, could Paul just sit back and say, well, it's actually all okay because I was just ignorant? No, Paul was still guilty. What did Paul still need? Mercy, he still needed the mercy of God in his life. And look at what, what does he say in verse 14? What overflowed to him? Grace. Again, God's grace. The grace of the Lord overflowed to him. Look at what it produced in him, and starting in verse 15. This saying is trustworthy, deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. There's a humility about Paul, is there not? Because he recognized who he was and who he would still be apart from God's grace and mercy in his life. So there was a humility about even the way he, he carried himself. How many of you guys were here as we went through the book of Acts on Sunday mornings uh, and, and Sunday morning worship? You remember? Just got to think back just a little bit to our journey through Acts. What, what were some of the things that struck you about the life of Paul as we spent so much time digging into to Paul's life? Was he arrogant? Was he entitled? Uh, you know, you know, talking about his accomplishments and what he had done. No, no, he always said.
Yeah. Amen. I think one of the ways we do that, right, is, is just that constant daily reminder that we are recipients of the grace and mercy of God. Paul never forgot that, right? Because he said, I, you know, if it weren't for Christ, right, he is nothing. He says, my life is of no value to me. I count everything, right, as, as loss in order that I might gain Christ. Right, like that is that is that is the testimony of a, of someone who has applied this to their life and continues to meditate on this beautiful understanding of of God being rich in these things that we're seeing tonight, and it produced in Paul this humility to say, God, if I must suffer, if that is what you want me to do in order to make Christ known, then I am willing to do that. Right, God, if you want to. If you want to exalt me and put me in places where I have influence uh, and the ability to speak even to kings and, and emperors, then God, here I am, use me. But it's not me, it's you, right? That, that is, should that not be our testimony as believers? Should there not be a humility in our lives that just points to, to what he has done? When we understand this, that, that is what it produces in our lives. His mercies are new every day. That's right. Uh, verse 16 in this passage here, he says, I receive mercy for this reason, that in me is the foremost Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. So Paul saw that. He goes, God, I'm just a trophy of your grace. I'm a trophy of your mercy and use me so that someone else might hear and know and see the gospel in my life. Why? Verse 17, so that Christ would be glorified, to him be honor and glory forever and ever. All right, that, that's Paul's testimony in a nutshell. Now, Ephesians chapter two, we need to spend a couple of minutes here before we move on. I want you to follow a progression here. Verses one through three. Paul talks about our condition before God apart from Christ. Just right there at your, as you're looking at those verses, look at what Paul says in verses one, two, and three, how he would describe our condition apart from Christ. Now, before you read it, let me pause and remind you, uh, he's going to say some harsh things. Uh, you probably didn't view yourself this way. You probably viewed yourself in a pretty favorable way before you came. You probably thought you were a pretty good person. Don't most people think they're pretty good people? All right, they're kind of cute. They got dimples and like, oh, yeah. okay. I mean, you're even here on a Wednesday night for church. You're, you're kind of the, the cream of the crop, right? So. Yeah, so listen, before you came to Christ, this is what the Bible says about you. What are, what's the ugly phrase in verse one that we don't want to think about? What are we? Oh, dead. How about verse two? Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. Who's that? Ouch. Yeah. The spirit that is now at work in what? The sons of disobedience. I bet you didn't want to come to church tonight and hear that you were dead and, the son, and a son of disobedience, did you? It's not real uplifting, is it, to hear those things? <laughs> How about verse three? What do you see, Jason? <laughs> what, what does it say? You were, you were by nature children of wrath. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a child of wrath? Yeah, but specifically, what is, what is it calling you to? If you're a child of wrath. Huh? A child of wrath. Yeah, that's another way of saying you were going to hell. Right? You're a child of wrath. Right now, look though, verse four, right? Like that's that's one of the uh, <laughs> it's 
one of the best verses in all of Scripture. After you read those first three verses, but God, that's a great transition right there. <laughs> what well, does so, it say about so it? So pause real here because I've used this. This is a good time for a quick illustration, change of pace just a little bit. Um, so uh, I've used this before. You've heard it. Uh, but um, most of the time, people view are, are coming to Christ like uh, you were driving along the road uh, in your car and um, maybe you got distracted or whatnot, uh, but because of your own negligence, you crashed the car on, on a ditch on the side of the road and uh, you, were, you were stuck. Um, but you reached into the glove box and you, you pulled out the uh, uh, owner's manual and you put on the flashers and then you, you set out some cones and you set off some flares. Um, and then you had injuries and, and you began to walk to the hospital that was, that was down the street. You did all of those things, uh, but there was no way that you were going to make it all the way to the hospital. But wouldn't you know it, Jesus, in his grace, came along and took you that final mile to the hospital. Okay, That is the way most of us view our coming to Christ. Okay, Now, we've just read the first half of this verse. Okay, And those first three verses said, yes, you were driving along in the car and you crashed on the side of the road due to your own sin and negligence. And what was the state when you were crashed on the side of the road? You were dead, okay? You were dead. You know what dead people don't do? reach into the glove box and read the instructions and set out cones and set off flares and begin to walk to the hospital. That's what dead people don't do. You know what dead people do? Stay dead. They lay there dead, right? So picture that scene right as we read verse four. You are dead in your sin, but... God, okay? I love but it. God. Look at this. Look at what the motivation, right? I mean, the result of all of this is that he made us alive in Christ, right? That's what he does. But look at what mercy motivates him to do that. God being rich in mercy is why we are now made alive. Grace was how he did it. We were made alive with Christ by grace, you have been saved. Now look at what it results in, a new position. He has raised us up, verse six, with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. In Christ, you have a new name, you have a new position, you have a new life, you are a new creation in him. Think about all of that. But it's not even over. Look at verse seven. There's more to come. So that in the coming ages, he could show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness, grace and mercy toward us in Christ Jesus. Did you know that there's more of your salvation that you were going to still experience, right, in the age to come? It just gets better and better and better. Then he summarizes it all in the passage that, we, that we've already talked about a little bit in verses eight and nine. For by grace, you've been saved through faith, and it's not a result of anything that you could do. But then verse 10, he gives us a new purpose, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Guys, I just want you to to see this passage. Read it multiple times this week, the whole thing, and just let, let the Holy Spirit just show you different aspects of this truth. This is like that diamond that you could just keep moving little by little, letting the light hit it in different ways just to see like the radiance and the beauty of it, right? This is one of those passages that just the more you read it, the more rich and and meaningful it becomes in your life. But I want you to see how it's all the foundation of all of it is his grace and mercy. Amen. Like that is what is so beautiful. All right, you've got a, a page here and I want us, we're gonna go through this quickly because I want us to get to something else. But there is, when we look at God's grace and his mercy in scripture, 
like there are things that it shows that this is in God's heart to do. He loves to do this. He wants to with all of his heart and soul. And when God talks about those things, it's always things that really talk about his mercy and his grace. So you see that in Lamentations and Jeremiah. We would say, hey, this is, this is like God's natural work. This is what he, would, he loves and delights in doing is to show grace and mercy. But there are places in scripture where we see what Isaiah chapter 28, verse 21 calls God's strange work. And in the context here of what the verse I've given, you can go back and read the whole chapter later. But the the context here is that God is going to fight against Israel. Because of their sin and their wickedness and their rebellion, he is going to fight against them. But look at what it says. For the Lord will rise up as on Mount Perazim, as in the valley of Gibeon, he will be roused to do his deed. But what does he say about this deed? Strange in his deed and to work his work. Alien is his work, right? The holiness of God does demand that his wrath be poured out on sin, right? But I think the beautiful thing we see in scripture is this, this picture of how, but what God longs to do is to show grace and mercy, even when he's having to execute judgment and pour out wrath. His heart is still to show mercy and grace. And we see that in specific examples in scripture of God's mercy, even in his judgment. Yeah, so there, when, when, you, when you think through God's judgment and uh, that God uh, will pour out his judgment, there is, there is a component of, of mercy and patience that is even woven into his judgment, right? So again, what we've heard over and over is God's delight and richness in mercy. But I wanna call your attention to, uh, so in Genesis chapter 15, if you know the context, God is giving his promises to Abraham. God is making a covenant with Abraham and Abraham's descendants, right? And he's promising one descendant that's coming. So as he's promising Abraham, giving him this covenant, he goes ahead and tells him a future event that is going to occur. He tells Abraham, your descendants are going to be enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. And here in this text, he tells why. He gives the reason for it. Okay, God has lots of plans that he is working out. He's gonna, he's gonna, this, the exodus is gonna happen. He's gonna show his covenant. There's gonna be lots of things, lots of cool things, but that's not the reason that he gives here. Why is the reason that he gives here for why uh, uh, Abraham's descendants are going into Egypt? No, what's the reason he gives right here? Look at verse 16, it's highlighted for you. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. You see, the Amorites were living in the land. What land? Promised land. Canaan, Israel. Okay, the land that the promised land, where where Israel is going to come back and get the land. So remember, as you as you read your Old Testament and. Israel's allowed to come in, and, and what are they told to do to all the people in the land? Slaughter them. Kill every single one of them. Men, women, child, no questions asked. So a lot of times you guys read, we all read that section of the Bible, and we're like, this is awfully harsh, okay? But here's what I want you to notice. This, this is also why people are like, well, the God of the Old Testament's so meanful and, and wrathful, but the God of the New Testament's love. Pay attention to this. God told Abraham way back then that this was going to occur. And why was it? He, God is going to send his people into Egypt for 400 years and wait. Why? 
because the sins of the Amorites is not yet complete. You know what that means? They haven't reached, they haven't reached the point of, no, well, they, God knows it's going to occur, right? He knows how long it's going to occur. And yet, God doesn't just shortcut the process, does he? How incredible is that? He, he doesn't just like, can we fast forward that part? No, he's patient in his judgment. Didn't he show patience with Adam and Eve? Didn't he promise them death? Yeah, death did come, but it could have been immediate justice. He is patient in his judgment and wrath, okay? So even in that, he would much prefer to be glorified by his mercy. You always hear, it is rich, it overflows. Yes, he has wrath, but it is incredible that there's even mercy in the midst of his judgment. Yeah. And that's, that's the testimony of, of Israel. If they were to give their testimony, this would be their testimony that even when God disciplined us, he was merciful and gracious and loving, compassionate, patient, and kind in the way he did it. And the, one of the most gruesome <laughs> uh, but beautiful at the same time pictures of that is, is Hosea, is in the message of the prophet Hosea. And I've given you a passage out of here, out of chapter 11, and I've highlighted some of those phrases for you that just show even when God is disciplining and judging his people, Right, what he says here, he goes, the more you were called, God tried to draw them back to himself. He, he beckoned for them to come back to him. He says, the more they were called, the more they went away. And, but God cries out, they did not even know that I had healed them. They were walking away knowing that I was the place for healing <laughs> where, they, where, they, where they would find redemption and yet they still walked away. So what does he do? He judges them. He allows them to be taken captive. But look at what it says in verse four about that captivity. He calls those chains that they were taken away in cords of kindness. Why could he call those cords of kindness? Because the only way they were ever going to see their sin and see what's in verse five, that they had let someone else become king instead of God being king was when they were taken into captivity, right? So it's his kindness that even judged his own people. He led them with cords of kindness, bands of love, right? They were bent on turning away from him, verse seven. But this phrase, like you can hear God, like the, the heart of a father whose heart is broken when they see their rebellious son. In verse eight, how can I give you up? How can I hand you over? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? Right, God's saying, how, you know, even to do this, even to punish you breaks my heart, right? Parents in the room, we feel that, right? Like we don't want to discipline our children, but we know that sometimes it is the most loving and gracious and merciful thing we can do is to show them the error of their ways, right? To correct their behavior, right? To help guard their hearts. And God says, like, I will not destroy you, verse nine. I will not destroy Ephraim. I'm God, not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. What's he talking about there? He's looking, he's looking to the future. He's like, you know, when is he talking? What coming is he talking about? The coming of Jesus, right? And when Jesus comes, what is Jesus going to do? Is he gonna come to exact judgment and pour out wrath towards sin? Yeah, he's gonna, when he comes, he is going to become sin. And it's this act, the greatest act of mercy and grace that he will display powerful, this picture. And we see that is, that is at the very heart of all of it, of the gospel and what we're to understand. 
the word that scripture uses over 246 times in the Old Testament for this idea is called hesed, right? Um, the, the core of it is this idea of mercy. Other words are used sometimes for it, compassion, love, loving kindness, grace. They're all used, but it is an action, not just a feeling that we see in scripture. It's, it's used in some very specific ways. We see it here in Exodus chapter 34, when the Lord says he will show steadfast love, but then we see it displayed in other people. We see Jonathan displaying this toward David in 1 Samuel. We see then David, because he was a recipient of this kind of love and grace and mercy from someone else, he then shows it to a family member of Jonathan's called by the name of Mephibosheth. I just like to say the name, uh, but he shows mercy. But then we see it again, another beautiful picture is Ruth. You know the story of Ruth in the Old Testament? It's one of my favorite books of the Bible. I love the story of Ruth. But in the story of Ruth, it says, we see Boaz shows this hesed toward Ruth, but you know why he does it? Verse, chapter three, verse 10 says, he saw the way Ruth showed Hesed toward Naomi and toward Boaz. And then Boaz shows that kind of love and compassion and kindness. Boaz turns around and shows it toward Ruth. So it's this incredible picture. And we're gonna stop with it there because here in a couple of weeks, we're gonna talk about redemption. And I wanna finish this story. So I'm gonna leave you hanging with the Ruth and Boaz picture because it's gonna come back up when we talk about redemption here in, in just a couple of weeks. But this idea is woven all through scripture. Why is that? Why do you think we read like 246 times in the Old Testament alone? We read about God's has said. You think he wants us to understand something about who he is, about his heart, about this work of redemption? that spans not just the New Testament, right? But, but the Old Testament as well, this picture of who he is. Absolutely. So what should it produce in us as believers, as those who are recipients of God's grace and God's mercy? Is there a call on our lives as believers? Scripture says there is, right? Scripture commands us to love mercy, Micah 6, verse 8. It's, I love it. He has shown you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you, right? But to do, to love, yeah, to do just, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Scripture calls us to be merciful, and I think the picture that's so beautiful is it's always attached to we show mercy to others that God has shown to us. That, that's the picture of when we, when we demonstrate mercy and grace, like we do so very mindful that we are just giving what has been given to us. Isn't that something the church should be known for? People that are gracious, people that are merciful. But I think that's one of the most beautiful ways that we reflect the heart of God is when we exhibit these two qualities uh, in the way we deal with people. Um, and, and the only way we can do that is with just meditating and a, meditating and then applying, right? On, on a daily basis, renewing our minds with this truth. God, it is only by your grace, right? It is only by your mercy. Your mercies that are new every morning that I can, I can walk this walk and I can live this life and I can show your love to a lost world around me and point them to Jesus. God, I need your grace today. I need your mercy today but then to have that confidence that God is rich in mercy 
and he longs to continue to lavish his grace upon you and give you the ability to walk with him every day. It's an incredible truth, amen? Amen. All right, we're gonna pause there and we're gonna pick back up in two weeks. All right, so next Wednesday, we've got a special night. You wanna tell them what's coming next Wednesday because this room will be used for something next Wednesday and we hope you'll come for it. Yeah, so uh, Wednesday, this this room, this spot, um, we are uh, having a uh, legacy presentation. So just a, a complete presentation of uh, the plans for the future in regards to uh, updating the children's building and the sanctuary seating and what that looks like. Um, if you have uh, not attended one of those informational uh meetings yet you are invited please 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 uh come uh just to hear that so it'll be uh wednesday night we'll have uh wednesday night dinner we'll have recharge and then uh this space will be uh full uh filled and go through that presentations we'll field questions pass out uh uh, some information, um, have some FAQs and, and those sorts of things, just to get everyone um, in the church up to speed um, with that information. So I uh, would love to have you guys here next Wednesday, this spot, this time. That's right. And then in two weeks, we will pick back up uh, on our study, and that will be a week we will look at redemption and reconciliation. Uh, will be our next topic in this study. So, and again, we'll kind of pick that up looking, one of the big things is looking at Ruth and Boaz. So uh, it's a beautiful picture of that, okay? So hope to see you back next week and then all the weeks after, okay? God bless you. Have a great rest of the week.